This is Thursday, September 13, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Wadsworth Stone. Welcome, Waddy. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born on September 28, 1923. And where were you born? Plainfield, New Jersey. And what part of New Jersey is that? That's in the north central part of New Jersey. And my understanding is you moved to Longmeadow shortly after that. That is correct. Okay. And where do you currently live? Currently live here in Natick at uh, Fairway Circle. Mm -hmm. And you are formerly of? Wellesley Hills. Mm -hmm. And uh, prior to that, lived outside of Chicago in Northbrook, Illinois. Okay. And your marital status? I'm a widower now. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you have children? I have three children, two girls and a boy. Mm -hmm. And they've given me seven grandchildren, five boys and two girls. Oh, wonderful. And any great-grandchildren yet? Not yet. There's still hope. Uh, tell us what Longmeadow was like growing up. It was a bedroom community very similar to that of Wellesley Hills. There was no industry, mm -hmm. but my father worked as the chief engineer for Bigelow Sanford Carpet Company down in Thompsonville and also Amsterdam, New York. Mm -hmm. And we lived there. I went to the grade schools, then I went into Springfield to Technical High School. And that school, believe it or not, had the greatest number of graduates going to MIT at that time. And um, from there, I went um, to uh, Norwich University, which is a military college up in Northfield, Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I had one year, and it was time to get into the military. That was in 19, the year spent at uh, Norwich. Mm -hmm. It was 1942-43, and in April of 1943, having passed both the Army Air Corps examinations and the Navy Air Corps examinations, I decided to go with the Army because trying to find that aircraft carrier is like looking for a postage stamp on the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so. Uh, in April of 43, I was shipped to uh, Nashville, Tennis Tennessee, where I was brought into the service, and we went through a lot of examinations. Mm -hmm. Following that, we headed for the Southeast Training Command of the Army Air Force, and uh, we went to Maxwell Field in Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. And we were there for roughly eight weeks getting basic training. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that time, it was getting very warm. But guess what? We were sent to Florida Ooh. for primary school, Ocala, Florida. There I was there for three months learning to fly the PT-17 Stearmans, which were a biplane. It's a great plane for aerobatics. And uh, the only time we found it cool was when we were up above the cloud levels. In the fall, we were transferred to basic training in Bainbridge, Georgia. And there we spent two months learning to fly the BT-17, uh, pardon me, BT-13s. And then following that, we were shipped to Mariana, Florida. Now we're being wintertime. And uh, we were there for advanced flying. And if we were successful, we would be commissioned, get our wings, and continue on. Fortunately, I was able to follow what I had always wanted to be, which was a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. Many of my buddies going through training 
went to bomber school, mm -hmm. whereas I was able to go to advanced fighter training. <clears throat> From there, we went to Eglin Field where I learned to go to gunnery school and also while it's still down in Florida, I learned to fly the P-40 mm -hmm. Kitty Hawk. Then we were sent to St. Andrews Air Force Base outside of Washington, D.C. And that's where I learned to fly the P-47 Thunderbolt. And we had an interesting time while we were there. We had one day when we went aloft and went over the coast to gunnery school. And when we came back, Andrews Air Force Base was closed in by fog. So they told us to go over to Washington, D.C. to uh, an airfield across the river from uh, what is now Reagan mm -hmm. uh, International Airport. And they only had very short runways. So we had to put it down in the first 10% of the runway. And as it was, I almost went into the river. Oh, dear. But fortunately, I was able to hold the brakes. And thereafter, we went, made it back to our base mm -hmm. and continued our training. Mm -hmm. From there, our training took us to Millville, New Jersey for additional gunnery school. And um, following that, we uh, then uh, were shipped to Richmond, Virginia. And Richmond was a central organizing point for shipping us overseas. And uh, we went from there up to Camp Kilmer outside of New York City, which is uh, not too far from Plainfield, New Jersey. And we were put on board um, ocean liners. Mm -hmm. And we left New York and spent Fourth of July on the high seas on our way to England. And uh, following that, we landed in Liverpool. We were transferred to an airfield outside of Shrewsbury, England, where we had our final training in gunnery school and other tactics we had to learn. Mm -hmm. And an interesting sidelight, when we were then sent to an airfield in England, where we were to be shipped over to France to our formal induction into the war. Mm -hmm. um, the um, night that I spent there at the airfield was in a huge hangar. When I got up in the morning, next to me was Edward G. Robinson a movie actor who was being sent to the armed forces over in France <coughs> to uh, entertain. Oh, wow. So we all had a chance to mm -hmm. talk with him. And then we were loaded on a plane. Mm -hmm. We flew over to Normandy, which was at that time uh, the latter part of July. And was this uh, July 44, 43? 44, 44. July, July 44, so I'm this sorry. Would have been, that's okay, that would have been right after the invasion. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, we were driven to our different air bases. Mm -hmm. Our particular, the 358 at that time, was located in a um, French um, chateau it belonged to a countess, and our airfield was cut out of an apple orchard. Mm -hmm. And we had 
Our squadron had rooms in one wing of her, <coughs> um, I don't want to say palace, but uh, chateau. Okay. She lived in another wing, mm -hmm. and the other two squadrons lived up on the upper level of a very large horse barn. It must have been two or three hundred feet long. Wow. And uh, our journeys across France first were to uh, clear out the Germans in the Brittany Peninsula. And then we joined forces and supported George Patton on his romp across France. Each day he was roughly 50 miles further across France. Mm -hmm. And they were having a great deal of trouble getting gasoline mm. and supplies to him. And they tried to hold him down. He said, I'm going to keep going as long as you <laughs> can get the fuel to me. And we supported him on front line. Other than that, we used to fly escort for medium bombers, which were the B-26s and the B-25s. And we were stationed near um, Pontorson mm -hmm. in the Brittany Peninsula, which is na right near Mount St. Michel. Our next base was outside of Reims, mm -hmm. and then we were put into Vitry le Francois, which used to be a major rail center, both in World War I and World War II, and it had been pretty well leveled. Ouch. Let's, uh, let's backtrack a little bit here. While you were going through all this extensive training, were you aware of the technological advances that were being made during the war as far as aviation was concerned? I mean, you were starting on a biplane and worked your way up to a P-47. Well, <clears throat> the P-47 Thunderbolts that we had mm -hmm. overseas were more advanced models mm -hmm. uh, than the ones we flew in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we carried 850 caliber machine guns. We could carry two 1,000 pound bombs, one under each wing. We had a belly tank, usually 150 to 200 gallons of gasoline. And uh, we could also carry rockets. Wow. We were a flying gun platform. That's essentially what it was. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so uh, we, we, uh, we were in Vitry Le Francois mm -hmm. in the fall, and they had floods. Uh -oh. And the airfield was cut out of flatlands along a river. We got out of there just before the river started to flood the airfield. Wow. <laughs> and we were sent to Toul, mm -hmm. where we spent the winter. We had a and we lived in the village of Toul. Mm -hmm. So you talk, are, are we still in uh, the Brittany Peninsula? or No, we're in the western, eastern part of France. Eastern France, okay. Yes. Toul is actually very close to Nancy. Okay. And most of our flying was between the Tsar region all the way to the Swiss border. And um, we flew a, a mission to support medium bombers when the weather cleared mm -hmm. at Christmas time to help the fellows at the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. In all of the missions that I flew, which was roughly 118 missions, I only saw German fighters four times we had what we call air superiority. Mm -hmm. And when we were in the vicinity with the German Messerschmitts, we ha were having to maintain formation. However, I'll tell you about an incident later on in the spring. Mm 
Um, on February 6, I was leading a flight over the Tsar region and we had been taught never to fly a straight line because Herman the flat gunner and his radar could pick us up. And that day, I forgot about the 30 second timing. I got hit with German flak mm -hmm. over the Tsar region. Fortunately, I got hit in an oil line mm -hmm. and the plane carried roughly 30 gallons of oil. So my wingman and I went over to the emergency channel and what we did is to get our bearings. They had us on radar and they told me that if I could make Strasbourg, which we commanded at that time, there was an airfield there, I could make a forced landing. However, I was not that lucky. I was part way there to Strasbourg when the engine started to freeze up. Uh oh. And the decision was, do I bail out or do I take her in? The P-47 Thunderbolt was built like a battleship. It was very rugged, yet she was a beautiful plane to fly. She responded very easily. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that if I could bring her in, I could probably walk away. And so I, in our training, we had always been taught from the very first day we flew a plane to always keep your eyes peeled for an open place in case you had to make a forced landing. So I was very fortunate. I was able to get into an area which was what we might call no man's land. And I was able to belly in, that's wheels up, in an open French field, which had roughly five feet of snow in it. So it was like landing a plane mm -hmm. on a toboggan. I was off, out of the cockpit, parachute and all, off the end of the wing for fear of the plane blowing up. And I landed in the five feet of snow right up to my armpits. Oh dear. So I turned around. I could hear the converter running on the plane. I said, gee, you forgot to turn it off. So I went back. My wingman that was with me was circling overhead. I called to him. I said, I'm fine. It's cold. And he radioed back to me telling me that they knew where I was and uh, I was safe. The only problem was I had on summer cover, uh, cover, coveralls for flying, leather jacket, no heavy gloves, and it was cold. But after a short period of time, an observer plane came by, having heard the situation over the radio, and it happened to be one of our boys up on the front lines spotting targets. And uh, he circled around and he dropped a match cover out saying that they will be there to pick you up. And uh, in a little while we had a six by six come up a road not too far from where I had landed. And I was picked up, taken to a field headquarters. However, while I was there with the plane, trying to stay warm, I could hear German 88 shells going overhead one way, and I could hear American 105 shells going the other way. So I was in no man's land. But in this case, you got out okay. <laughs> right. As the saying goes, God was my co-pilot. Mm -hmm. And I've been very lucky ever since. Wow. So, 
And this is, of course, is the model of the plane that you flew. That's right. And it is looks like just just you in there. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, were, you were you were just uh, you were the only one in there, right? That's right. Okay. You're it. Mm -hmm. You're the pilot. You're the navigator. You're the gunner. You're the engineer. Mm -hmm. Everything comes back to you. Uh -huh. So, uh, but I was sent back to my base the next day. Mm -hmm. um, the fellow with the Cub, uh, which was a spotter plane, he flew me back to my base, which was in Toole. Mm -hmm. And following an examination by the flight surgeon, which we had on the base, uh, they said, well, we're going to send you to England for rest and recuperation. I said, well, I'm ready to fly again. Mm -hmm. So I went to England and to a, um, an estate outside of uh, Oxford where they sent a lot of pilots to get some rest and recuperation. And uh, we had a great time while we were there. And uh, the only thing about the estate was it was also a storage place for the British big bombs that they had, the giant bombs that they used to carry over to Germany. And we thought, if the Germans ever knew, we wouldn't be around. Mm. And I went back mm -hmm. to my base after a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, I was with the group all the way through to the end of the war. The last mission I flew was probably the longest and most fruitful, which happened to be on the day the war ended. We were sent out early in the morning, and our mission was to get the Germans who were escaping through the Bavarian Alps down near Salzburg into Yugoslavia. And uh, that mission lasted four and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And after you sit on a parachute for four and a half hours, mm -hmm. you're ready to get out. Mm -hmm. And one of the, we found the Germans, and while we were taking care of business, we got the word, come on home, the war is over. Oh, shucks, we were having a good time. <laughs> but um, flying home, along the, the, the Bavarian and German Alps, I saw some of the most beautiful country that hadn't been touched by the war. And I often thought, why did Germany really want to go to war? But that was a part of Germany, from what I understand, that really had no thoughts of wanting to go to war. But we were, I was sent home from when we got back to the base. We were there for three or four weeks. And then I was sent to England and sent home. And I flew a B-17 on the way home. Piloted or rode I, uh, it? I was, I, was, I was actually with a group. Mm -hmm. And the, the regular bomber pilot, he says, come on up, I'll let you fly it for a while. He was bored. <laughs> Flying across the ocean at 150, 200 miles an hour mm -hmm. was a long trip. And how fast could these run? Well, I saw it go past the red line in a dive. The red line was at 500 and something. Oh, brother. We were told never to go really across the red line mm -hmm. because we would get into what they call compressibility and you would lose control. Mm -hmm. It was because we had were still in the stages of learning what compressibility really was, and the sonic barrier. Mm -hmm. Of course, today our jets are designed, and they can go through it without an batting an eyelash. And what rank were you when the war ended? First lieutenant. They offered me to be a captain if I would stay over, and I said, no, I'm going to go home. Mm -hmm. When I got back to the States, 
I had a month of recuperation at home, and then I went to Atlantic City to be discharged, and they offered, they said, well, if you don't want to be discharged, you, we'll t let you go to the war in Japan, because we were still in the war with, with Japan. Mm -hmm. And so three of us, at Uncle Sam's expense, drove across the U.S., did the national parks on the way, and wound up in Bakersfield, California, the night the war ended with Japan. So we checked into an airfield north of Bakersfield called Minter, mm -hmm. where we spent roughly a month's time, and then we were sent home. And I was discharged when I got back mm -hmm. in September of... 45? 45. 45. So that gives you an idea. Mm -hmm. So you were in California when you got word about the atomic bomb? Yes. Okay. Actually, we had heard of something about it. The first, the, when they exploded the atomic bomb test mm -hmm. out in Nevada, mm -hmm. was probably when we were on our way to California but they didn't say anything about mm -hmm. it. We, knew, we suddenly found out what it was all about when the war was starting to end, mm -hmm. because it was in the news. Right. But uh, so that gives you an idea of what mm -hmm. I went through. So during the, um, let's go back to a little bit more during the war years. Okay. For example, when um, were you kept up to date on on the war news and? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. We had the Stars and Stripes, mm -hmm. which was a newspaper that came out in the European theater. Mm -hmm. In fact, my little mission where I got shot at and had to make a crash landing was written up in the Stars and Stripes. So mm -hmm. other than that, why I've consider myself very lucky. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you did everything from meet Edward G. Robinson to <laughs> plow a P-47 into five feet of snow and hopefully got off without a scratch. I didn't have a scratch. I, all I was complaining about it, it was cold. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, uh, what did you think about your wartime experiences? Well, I was well treated. Mm -hmm. Uh, sure, we had it rough, but fortunately, they made an effort for all of us who were in France, in fighter groups, supporting the front lines and the medium bombers. The accommodations that they found for us were pretty decent. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in Toul, which we were there all winter, during the winter months, um, we lived in an apartment building in town, and uh, so when we had a mission early in the morning, they'd come in and pick us up and take us out to the airfield. Um, our crew chiefs and mechanics and the armament people all um, lived in tents which they had winterized, and they all had the so-called pot belly stoves to stay mm -hmm. warm. Um, our actual f headquarters at the field, um, we had discovered a prefab building from somewhere locally, and we actually set it up so it was our quarters mm -hmm. for uh, our briefing room, our administrative staff of the squadron, and where we kept all our parachutes mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. But our planes were outside all winter long. And uh, in, in the winter when there was any thought of snow or ice or what have you, they were covered with canvas. Mm -hmm. and of course, at nighttime we used to get bed check Charlie 
that's a German pilot who comes over and just sees who see if they can find something. Mm -hmm. Only at night, though. And we used to call him Bedcheck Charlie. But other than that, we very seldom saw the German fighters. Most of our work was taking out the rail lines mm -hmm. on the Rhine River. The Germans were very good about reestablishing the uh, rail lines. We take out the locomotives and take out the freight cars, come back the next day, the trains were running again. Anything to get their supplies through. Mm -hmm. And um, one experience which I never was very happy about, one day we were told to go after a church oh. in the Tsar region. We were told it was loaded with am German ammunition and bombs and what have you. And believe it or not, when we hit it, it was like the atom bomb going off. The Germans also used rail cars with red crosses on them to transport ammunition and what have you. And you never knew whether there was American troops on board or Germans or what it was, but we were told to go after it. Those, are the, those were the tough decisions. Mm. Other than that, going after a German airfield, mm -hmm. we almost always lost somebody. Mm -hmm. It was one of the missions that we did not like mm. because the German airfields were very heavily armed mm -hmm. and it was a case of get in quick and get out quick so that you didn't get hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the milk runs, as we used to call them, were escorting the medium bombers. We didn't have to... The only time I saw a German fighter, one of the few times, we were warned. We were leading a mission of bombers over Nuremberg. And we came in contact with them. And on the way into Nuremberg, they were dropping chafe to fox the German radar. Mm -hmm. And the controller called to us and said, keep your eyes peeled. There's somebody up there watching you. And suddenly we saw, coming in from my left, uh, right side, an ME2, ME262 German jet. And he was going after the lead bombers, which were dropping chafe. And I said, he's headed over that way. I'm going to go over there and see if I can get him. And I got a few shots in on him. And when he knew that we were on his tail, he threw the thr throttle to the wall, and he was gone like a rocket. The first sighting of a jet. Wow. So that was my really only real encounter with a German aircraft. Mm. Now, do you feel that um, overall the leadership that, that you received was adequate? Oh, we had excellent people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as far as high command was concerned, mm -hmm. no problem. We were well taken care of. Mm -hmm. from, the, from the standpoint of being properly fed mm -hmm. and given the best of accommodations. We were the glamour boys. And a lot of people used to complain, we looked sort of sloppy when we were down on the ground, but when we went airborne, it was absolute discipline. We flew tight formations, and we minded our business when we got up over in combat. Mm -hmm because you covered your buddies and they covered you. Otherwise, the Germans would come in, psh, take mm -hmm. you out. You were mentioning the squadron earlier. Tell us a little bit about the basic, uh, like a buildup of a squadron. Uh, for example, how many of these P-47s oh. would there be? 
the, um, the fighter group, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, is made up of three fighter squadrons. Mm -hmm. Each fighter squadron had about 24, 25 mm -hmm. planes. Mm -hmm. And each fighter plane had a crew chief, an assistant crew chief. Mm -hmm. We had an engineering staff. We had an armament officer who saw to it that the planes were properly loaded with ammunition mm -hmm. and the right type of bombs that we were going to be using that day or that for that mission. And um, <clears throat> they also had a central maintenance division for maintaining aircraft that were damaged. The P-47 Thunderbolt would make it home almost all the time. We had fellows who had cylinders shot out. They still would keep running. The Pratt & Whitney aircraft uh, engines that we had were air-cooled, but they were a beautiful engine. And uh, they uh, brought us home the same way with a plane. We had an, any number of planes come home with wings mm -hmm. full of flak holes. Mm -hmm. Still make the grade. Yeah. I'm just going to have you hold up the plane you flew. Yep. There we go. And that was taken, and where was that taken? This was taken in Sandhofen, not far from the Rhine River. Mm -hmm. Sandhofen was actually a German training school for pilots, which we took over. Mm -hmm. So we had. Uh, permanent buildings while we were there. And it's not too far from uh, Ludwigshaven and Mannheim, which was a big chemical center on the mm. Rhine River. And uh, it was south of Frankfurt. And uh, we weren't allowed off the base mm -hmm. because they didn't want us to have any contact with the local people. Because of our orange tails, mm -hmm. we were a marked group. And the Germans, if they ever got a, uh, an indication that the orange tails were around, mm -hmm. or if you were, say, an, uh, captured as an enemy part of the orange group, you might not be here today. Mm. You were mentioning before the interview uh, you were at a reunion, and you were talking about the pi mm -hmm. uh, one of your pilot buddies, the first time you had seen him since the war, and he was not one of the lucky ones. That is correct. Now tell us a bit Herb about Herb Easterling. He came to the reunion. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I'd seen him, and he was lost sometime in the late uh, part of 1944, the early part of 1945. I don't remember which ex exactly when, but um, I hadn't seen him. But unfortunately, when he had to bail out, uh, he broke a leg in the process of landing. It was captured by the Germans. And uh, unfortunately, he was not given the medical care that he should have been given. And the net result was that he was all, always crippled with, with a bad leg mm -hmm. for most of his life. But uh, other than that, he was in good spirits, and it was gr great to see him. Mm. We had a certain camaraderie that is hard to explain because we had to work together as a team, even though we were individuals. Uh, when we flew, we, we took care of each other. And uh, so I hope that gives you a picture of mm. what life was like. Definitely. So let's go back now to the war has ended. You're, you've had a chance to recuperate. What happens now? Well, when I came back to the United States, as I mentioned, I'm take sorry. That. That's all right. I'll take it. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, I went through um, 
Atlantic City with the mm -hmm. idea in mind of going to uh, either being discharged, and three of us decided to go to California and mm -hmm. go on to Japan. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, the Japanese called it, called it quits, mm -hmm. and so I got to come home. And we drove across the USA in a 1936 Ford two-door sedan. <laughs> and most of our trip was done because it was in the summer, we drove at night mm -hmm. and, s and found a place to stay during the day. Mm -hmm. But we did the um, Grand Canyon, we did Bryce, Zion, and uh, we spent a couple of nights at a lodge on the shores of Lake Mead, which was then mm -hmm. part of, uh, formed by the, the uh, Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we didn't go into Las Vegas or spend any time in Las Vegas. Well, there wasn't much of Las Vegas there at the time. <laughs> no. no, it's a big place now. Mm -hmm. But, uh, no, it was, a, it, it, to me, it was a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main reason for being a pilot was I didn't want to be drafted because then I might be sent someplace other than um, where I'd want to be. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, give it a try. If you get washed out, okay, but I made the grade. And uh, so I feel that I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. What happened after your cross-country experience? Did you go back to school? Yes. Mm -hmm. I had one year of college before I went in the service. Mm -hmm. So I went and interviewed several schools and I wound up at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York mm -hmm. and uh, went to the engineering school. Mm -hmm. I have a degree Bachelor of Science in Administrative Engineering, which is basically mechanical with uh, uh, management mm -hmm. uh, courses added. It was the beginning of a five-year course, which today is done in two separate stages in most cases. But while there, in the first year, uh, a friend of mine from Longmeadow owned a, a Piper Cub airplane. So I joined him. It was really nothing more than a glider with a 40 horsepower engine on it. But it, my studies took, took precedence, mm -hmm. so I had to give it up after a year or so. But. Uh, I've done some, I actually got a commercial license and uh, a private license, but because of college, I didn't really follow s suit along those lines. But uh, I have been flying since. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a picture taken last June, was Father, Father's Day, uh, there was, um, a gathering called Wings and Antique Cars out in Stowe, Massachusetts at the Colling Foundation. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And the Wellesley Historical Society back in 2010 had their annual meeting and I was invited. And uh, I'd also been in the Memorial Day Parade in 2010 with a lot of us veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, during the, his, the Wellesley Historicals annual meeting, they had a silent auction. I bid on a flight on an AT-6 up here in Fitchburg. And unfortunately, before I ha had a chance to follow through on the bid, the fellows who had the AT-6 was in a, a, an accident at the airport in Fitchburg. 
and he was taking up children in, in uh, for a chap who had a family of children. Mm -hmm. And he had spent $36,000 to have the engine overhauled. And on the final approach to the Fitchburg airfield, which has a river running around roughly mm -hmm. three sides of it, the engine quit. And they, when you're in your final approach, you're very close to the stalling speed of the plane. Your wheels are down, and unfortunately you hit the riverbank at the end of the runway. The plane flipped over, from what I understand. The youngster who was in the back seat lived, but unfortunately the pilot died due to drowning in the river. So, last June, the uh, President, uh, Martin Padley of the Wellesley Historical Society, called me and he said, how would you like to go up in an AT-6? He said, wonderful, let's go. <laughs> he said, I want to make it up to you that because you had lost out before. And so, that Sunday afternoon, he and his, the treasurer drove me out to Stowe, and uh, I got to f go up in an AT-6, mm -hmm. which I hadn't flown since way back in 1944. Mm -hmm. And I got talking with a pilot while we were taxiing out, and he's, he said, what is your experience? He said, well, I flew P-47 Thunderbolts in World War II. Oh, he lit up just right off the bat. <laughs> And when we got airborne, he said, you've got the controls. So I flew it for maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes, circling around the countryside. No problem. It comes right back to you. It's like riding a bicycle. Mm -hmm. mm. However, he was in the forward seat of the AT-6. And... Uh, so I had to depend on him to be my eyes mm. going forward. But it was no problem flying it. Oh, that must have been thrilling. It was. It was a fantastic afternoon. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, well, do you want to do some aerobatics? I said, I think I'm going to let you do the aerobatics. And so we did a Shondell, Lazy 8. Mm -hmm. We did a barrel roll, which I love to do. Oh. And we did a loop. Wow. And so we had a wonderful afternoon. And uh, besides that, I got to see a lot of antique cars, and I saw some antique airplanes that they have at the, in their hangar. They have a beautiful hangar mm. up there. And uh, they had a PT-17 Stearman, which is what we used in primary school. So. That's my latest. Okay. Now you mentioned that you had three children. Now, did uh, any of the children enter the military? No. 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 Oh. My my the two oldest I have my oldest is a, is my daughter. She's mm -hmm. sixty. And then I have another daughter who's about fifty four, fifty five. Mm -hmm. Don't hold it to me now. <laughs> That's all right. And my son is fifty two. Mm -hmm. My son has learned to, uh, has learned to fly. Mm -hmm. He lives in Wilton, Connecticut, and he has two boys. And my oldest daughter has three children, two boys and a girl. And my middle daughter, or middle youngster, mm -hmm. uh, she has a boy and a girl. And if they're not out of college, they're in college. Right. And have any of the grandchildren considered going into the military? I don't think so. Okay. The military today and the wars that we're in today entirely different mm. than what World War II was. In World War II, we knew who the enemy was because he had his own uniform, his own equipment. Today, we don't know who the, really the enemy is in many cases. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of a war. 
And if they want to go, I'm not going to necessarily stop them, but I'm going to make sure that they know the stories that mm -hmm. I went through. But um, in most cases, I don't think that they're interested. Mm -hmm. They got their hands full taking care of the kids. Right. As uh, did you join any um, veterans organizations? No, I haven't. I've been more busy in business mm -hmm. as an engineer, mm -hmm. and it. Uh, my experience has taken me across the United States, Mexico, Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, but I'm in a fascinating field. Mm. I work in steel mills, foundries, forging plants, brick plants, ceramics, textiles, you name it. So it keeps me busy. I'm still busy. I'm still in business. Wow. Now. I'm just another workaholic. <laughs> <laughs> Wadsworth, is there anything else you'd like? Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, you were mentioning reunions. Mm -hmm. And you were also mentioning uh, that you've been to Tennessee and other parts mm -hmm. of the country. Uh, tell us a little bit about those reunions. Well, it was great to see your buddies and to meet other members. Um, I probably remember those of my squadron more so than the other two squadrons that I was mm -hmm. with over there. We were pretty well, I would say isolated, but we just didn't mm -hmm. necessarily get together. Right. But um, it was get, it, we, we, we had some very good times at these reunions. Uh, one reunion, which I haven't mentioned, was back in 1994, which was the P-47 Thunderbolt Pilots Association, which covered all of those who flew P-47 Thunderbolts, whether it was in Europe, mm -hmm. or in the Pacific, or in the China, Burma, India mm -hmm. theater. And I went, uh, we had a reunion in Paris. And my roommate was a chap who lived in Florida, and uh, we'd never met, but we turned out to be buddies. <laughs> and um, the reunion in Paris um, gave us an opportunity. I went to um, Claude Monet's home in Givenay, and uh, we had a trip to Normandy and we saw the cemetery, which is absolutely beautiful. It, all the crosses had been cleaned. The grass was beautiful. The whole area was beautifully done. It's actually a parcel of land at the beachhead, which the French government has given to the United States and the U.S. maintains it in very nice condition. I had hoped to get back to Cretville, which is where I first joined the, f the fighter group, to see what the chateau looked like. At the time we were there, it was known as a pink chateau. And, uh, we also were wined and dined in Deauville by the mayor of Deauville in their beautiful hall, which had crystal glass chandeliers and what have you, and we were awarded some sort of a medal mm -hmm. for our, as a thank you for what we did. It was also an opportunity at these various places where we were honored during that reunion of a week, the underground people of France who had never been acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting, we had a, the one in Deauville, we also had one at City Hall in, Fran in Paris, 
in which the mayor of Paris at the time honored the members of the underground who helped us. And we also were honored by the um, French Air Force down in St. Dizier. And uh, on that trip, we went to the um, uh, one of the, the Champagne wineries. And for dinner, the French really put out a real dinner for all of us. Mm -hmm. There were quite a few of us. And then they put on an air show in the afternoon with French Mirage fighter jets. I even got to sit in one of them. It didn't have as much cockpit room as my old P-47 <laughs> Thunderbolts. Didn't get to fly it, huh? No. No. But uh, it was a very interesting week. And there were a number of us. The last night we were there, we had a cruise on the, the River Seine in, in Paris on a uh, dinner boat. We had the top deck complete with an orchestra. It was like a beautiful summer day. All the girls or, or wives were dressed up. And every time we passed under a bridge, we had a champagne toast mm -hmm. to the bridge. And there were 32 oh, no. toasts. Mm -hmm. But we had beef wellington. Uh -huh. And uh, it was a beautiful night. The next day it rained, the day we left. <laughs> Another stroke of luck. <laughs> Wadsworth, is there anything else you'd like to say for those who will be watching this in the future? Not really. I mean, I think I've said enough for one day. I um, think you have <laughs> as well, but we can always edit. <laughs> Wadsworth Stone, thank you so very much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you. Mm -hmm.